Welcome back to the curriculum. My name is Matt Gildersleeve. I am your host. This podcast is brought to you by Hawk and Dynamics, the world leader in innovative force plate technology. Hawk and Dynamics takes a user-centric approach featuring a fully customizable cloud-based software that allows users to easily digest and analyze complex force plate data. Their technology is constantly evolving, much like an app update for your iPhone. They communicate with users on a daily basis to make their systems better. In addition to all of that, they also offer the most competitive price for a bilateral force plate on the market. And they're the only force plate company offering a completely wireless system. Not to mention their CEO, Bennett Watson, is a genuinely great, authentic human being, and they're just great to work with. We want to thank Hawk and Dynamics for their sponsorship. Enjoy the episode. All right, we're really excited here today to bring you guys another episode. We have uh, on the Coaches versus COVID-19 mini-series here. Just before we get started, I want to remind everybody the main purpose of this, and that is to continue fundraising money. Uh, if you can, you can go to www.coachesversuscovid19.com. That's with the numbers, one nine, coachesversuscovid19.com. And that's where you can find the GoFundMe page that is directly donated to the CDP. Uh, we're continuing to try to work up to that $200,000 mark. Um, whether that be a donation, whether that be an episode sponsorship, whatever you guys can uh, afford to do right now, we would greatly appreciate it as we continue to, to battle this COVID-19 as a, as a country and as a world. So with that being said, I will introduce our co-host, Drake Berbere of Strength of Speed, and I'll let him take it from here. What's up, guys? We have two companies that have sponsored the episode today. Um, the first one is Exergio Technologies. I'm um, Exergio. They're the makers of the G Flight, the G Sprint, and G Strength. They're accurate, affordable exercise technology. Stop guessing, start assessing. And they can be found at exergio.us. Um, I started out using the, the Exergio G Flight. That was kind of my first intro into sport tech uh, many years ago, but um, very accurate tool, especially when compared to uh, state of the art tech like Forest Plates. Um, our, our other company sponsor for today is Bridge. They have sponsored the last two. Uh, they will also sponsor the remaining podcast from here on out. They have donated um, $1,000 to the Coaches vs. COVID-19 uh, fundraiser. Bridge Athletic builds high-performance training tools for coaches, trainers, physical therapists, and athletes at the highest levels of their field. Bridge Athletic's marketing market-leading platform allows industry practitioners to leverage the power of the cloud and big data to revolutionize the way performance programs are created, delivered, and tracked. They work with over 250 elite organizations, including teams across every professional sports league, Power 5 NCAA conference, as well as a number of national governing bodies, youth organizations, um, a, a lot of private organizations they work with. Um, their values align with us here at Coaches vs. COVID-19. Um, they provide a financial support to our cause and stepped up to support the community by creating a remote product free of charge through the end of the year for school-based coaches. Uh, learn more about this at bridgeathletic.com. Um, thank you to you guys for uh, uh, your continued support to the Coaches vs. COVID-19 um, fundraiser. All right, uh, now to intro our speaker for today. Really excited to have her on here. It is Dr. Tiff Jones, and she is a certified mental performance consultant for X Factor Performance Consulting. Um, and I'll kind of pass it off here to, to Tiff and she'll tell you a little bit about her background. Hi everyone, thanks guys for having me on. I'm really excited for this. Um, yeah, so I've been a certified mental performance consultant for about 17 years. I work with pro athletes and pro teams all the way down to the youth level. Um, and if anyone's wondering what mental performance consulting is, it's basically tack tackling two prongs. One is the authentic relationship side of teams. So anything from culture and accountability and communication between coaches and staff, coaches to players, players to coaches, et cetera, um, players to players. And then also the performance end, which is my favorite, which is tackling like basically how do we create practices and environments that psychologically and physiologically mimic what coaches or what athletes are going to experience when they are under pressure and stress. So, um, yeah, that's basically what I do on the regular basis. And, um, yeah, this is, uh, these times have definitely created some challenging, um, you know, experiences, especially having to go pretty much all virtual, but it's also allowed for some creativity and, um, you know, thinking outside of the box and in, in our field. So. 
Yeah, it seems like now more than ever, this is going to really highlight a lot of those things. I think one thing we've talked about is, at least I predict that teams that had really good culture are going to have a lot more success this, this season than teams that didn't going into this break. But uh, what what do you think is kind of coming out of this as teams have been away from each other for three, four months? What are going to be the most important things in, in getting that culture going or maintaining that culture, I guess you would say, as, as you get guys back on campus? Yeah, so I think one of the big things is that we have a misnomer that if you're on campus, you're going to build these really strong, authentic relationships. But because of the phones and everything else, like I always say, I'm not trying to create team fun. Like I don't need team fun. We need things that are going to be like what I call team revealers, where you're really exposing um, different morals, values, ethics of each other, understanding and valuing one another as humans. And so it's really interesting because like I think virtually it's actually forcing teams to have more authentic relationships and be more creative. Um, and everyone's like, Tiff, this isn't fun. It feels forced. I'm like, yeah, it's forced. Yeah, it's forced because you're not doing it if it wasn't forced. And honestly, you weren't doing it when you were on campuses or with each other anyway. And even with the pro teams, a lot of times you're just leaving and going home to your families. And so that stuff's not happening. Um, and then I'm always like, if you want team fun, then you can do things on your own virtually that have nothing to do with it. But, you know, building culture should be purposeful. It's effort takes a lot of effort. It's not fun. It's uncomfortable. Um, and so I find that the teams that are really pouring into that and trying to be creative and embracing that and really, um, if you want to win, then that's what you need to be doing right now. What advice do you have for, I know, you know, for us, because of all the NCAA restrictions we have right now, mm -hmm. there's a lot of things we as coaches can't do. So we've really had to take, you know, our leaders are, we, we have 16 off season captains and we've really tried to work through them. And, and, you know, once a week I meet with them and I just ask them, you know, what are your biggest challenges right now? And pretty much unanimously, a lot of them just, you know, they're starting to realize what we all know, which is getting through to the, the resistant guys, the guys that are resistant to the culture, the guys that don't really want to build the relationships. What, what advice, if you were sitting with those 16 guys in front of you right now, what would your advice be during a time like this on how to build that and how to work through that, that resistance? Well, I think you got to find the why behind it. Like, why do they not want to do it? Yeah, we don't like the behavior, but unless you get to the why of why don't they, why are they resistant? Because I, honestly, like, I'd go back to like, what do you guys want to do? And they'll say, well, I want to win or I want to be an All-American or whatever. I'm like, well, then this is a piece of it and trying to sell them, sell them on that. Um, and then there's always like different players that maybe shouldn't be there. Um, if you have to fight so hard all the time, like I'm okay spending time on the younger guys, you know? But if you're an older guy and you're not buying in, um, I'm looking at, I'm going back to the coaches and saying, coach, they're not buying in. I don't care how good they are. And then you might have to make different decisions. Um, but the younger guys, it's just educating and teaching and trying to like get them to understand the importance of it. And um, I would call BS on someone if they don't want to do it. Cause I'm like, well, then you don't want to win or you don't really care about like how the team is going to perform. Um, but I think sometimes coaches put too much on the athlete in the sense of like, you got to get this guy to buy in, buy in, buy in. And they're constantly showing you by their behavior that they don't want to buy in. And so why are we putting, and that's exhausting to the players after a while. And so then I always look back at the coach and say, Hey, your players have done what they need to do. It's up to you now to make a different decision. So what is that cutoff point then? Cause I know we talk about it all the time. At what, at what point is it time to cut bait? Uh, when you're just spending so much energy and it's exhausting, again, I'm all good with first years or freshmen or younger guys, rookies, um, to try to pull them in. But by the time you're like a junior, come on now, like you're a junior, senior. Um, and, and it's, it's the guy that you're always like, or a woman, you're always trying to pull in. Like it's exhausting. Like I'd rather you go and try to get the other people that like are at least showing behavioral changes. And that's the thing. If they're not making any behavioral changes at all, well, they're, they're constantly just, like, showing, like, just throwing up the stop sign at you all the time. And I'm like, what? enough is enough. That's on us then. That's the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And so I'm okay if someone makes small incremental changes. As long as they're making changes, I'll have some patience. But I find that we hold on to people way too much when they're constantly showing you behaviorally that they don't, they're not buying in and they don't want to be there. What do you find disrupts good culture the most out of all like you know you've you've consulted for so many is there is there a trend or a common theme like like man this is really what I would say disrupts culture more than anything else Oof. um yeah I mean I think when you have people with their own agendas I think when you have people that are not high character people like honestly when they're not or or honestly they don't have the life skills I think a lot of times we're not developing the basic life skills of like self-assessment being able to look in the mirror and take accountability so lack of accountability people um the communication will kill you 
Um, so not going directly to someone and having that communication or having that trust with the coaching staff. I think the trust piece is huge. Like the coaches being vulnerable with the athletes and the athletes being able to be vulnerable. And I think sometimes we hear the word vulnerability, but the biggest piece of mental toughness and mental skills is to be vulnerable first, because if you can't look within, um, if you can't have the hard conversations with your teammates or with your, with your coaches, because you're worried about, um, playing time being affected or whatever, then, um, yeah, so I would say communication, accountability, selfishness um, will completely destroy a culture. It's crazy to hear you talk about assessing and assessment is something we've been talking about lately. I've, I've had this really good opportunity to sit in on this, this leadership council or development. Um, it's called the exchange, and it's a mixture of military leaders and, and, and football and sports leaders. But there's, you know, there's, there's multiple three-star generals on there. And then there's, you know, head football coaches all throughout the, the country on it. But the one thing that really, really surprised me last week, we were talking about culture and these three-star generals, you know, we were talking about changing culture and the, the multiple three-star generals, they talked about how, you know, we we try to change culture, but that's not the first step. The first step is understanding the current culture you have before you try to change it. And if you if you if you just go in and try to say this is what we're going to do, this is what we're going to change. Like very very often is is you know you you can't change it until you understand it. Until like you said, you you assess it. Any um anything thing you have or, or tools you specifically use for you know if we consulted you and said hey come look at our culture, what do you do to assess it and what are you assessing? So sure. I mean, I think the first step is I always want to just watch. So you watch practice, you watch team meetings, you just are around and you're just observing because I think um, you can say a lot of the right things and you're going to know behaviorally. I just, I just want to see it. I don't want to hear about it. Um, I think the other big piece is sitting down and asking questions um, and sitting down with individuals or sitting down with the coaching staff and, and you just ask questions um, I mean, I'm not trying to trick anyone. I'm not asking like ridiculous questions, but you, you just want to hear about, it's amazing when you sit and just ask and ask and ask questions and just listen how much you can get out of a 30 minute period. And usually over time, you're going to start to fee see patterns and themes. Um, and you're going to hear little nuances and little words that come out and, and ways that they describe things. Um, and you'll just be like, wow, this is like, a this is legit or wow, we've got some kinks in the armor or wow, this is a complete like mess. Um, and you usually can see it and feel it in, in not that long of a time. Honestly, I just think we, we, we talk too much and we don't listen enough to our athletes. Um, and we don't, aren't willing to ask the right kinds of questions. And so a lot of it is the kinds of questions you ask. Um, and, it, and it's the trust piece because they want to know, like, you know, if they're holding back or they don't want to tell, but even then you can tell if they're holding back. Um, and if they're, if they're holding back, that usually is a huge sign because then there's not a lack of trust probably within the culture in general. Um, so yeah, I mean, observation and then just sitting down and really just talking to each individual that's part of the, the team. You're, my staff is probably laughing right now because you're hitting a ton of like, this has been our, this has been the thing we've been talking about and debating and the questions. And we, we were talking about the other day, um, you know, like athletes who you're like, man, this guy just doesn't, he just doesn't want to open up. He just doesn't want to really buy into what we're doing. And what we talked about is like, well, what are you trying to talk to him about? Like, are, are, are you trying to have a conversation about things you want to have a conversation about? Or are you trying to talk to him about things that he might want to talk about, which maybe that is politics and I hate politics, but maybe that's politics. So guess what? If I want to get through that guy, I got to bring up some of those points. But I think that is, that is so powerful. What you say is, is are you asking the right questions? I think that's a, that's a massive thing. I guess we, we, we skip this and probably should go back to it. Tiff, but what is culture? How do you define culture? It's interesting. Cause uh, I'm work. Uh, True North sports is a, uh, a company run by Celia Slater who does all this stuff with coach development and they're creating a culture um, workbook right now for coaches to go through this. So it's interesting because I've been reading a lot about it and um, the, the contributors and what they're writing about it. And so I think um, not to steal from them, but I think, again, it goes back to culture is where the authentic relationships and what goes into authentic relationships is that trust, that vulnerability, the accountability, the communication, all of that, where that then meets um, commitment, like performance commitment. So like hydration, nutrition, all that kind of stuff, like all of that. Um, and then, and then those two, those, those two axes, then you X, Y axis then goes into like your performance, like what, what I see when you actually are under pressure and stress. And so what is culture? It's where those two things connect. 
um, the performance piece or not the performance piece, but like, yeah, all the things that make up a, a great like athlete, a great team in terms of when you are on the ice or on the field or on the course and then those authentic relationships. And so that is those two huge components create culture basically. And, um, and you, and you feel it, it's almost like this, you just know it. It's almost like, you know, it when you see it, when you feel it, um, and you can't replicate, um, there's a debate of like, who sets the culture, who sets the culture is the coaches. Like, don't, don't pretend. I tell athletes all the time, who sets the organizational values and the athletes are always like, we do. I'm like, no, you freaking do not. Um, the coaches better be. And that's, what's crazy is everyone thinks like, once you have a great culture, it's always going to be there. That's baloney. Like if one, if a coach leaves, even if you have an alum take over the program, that program is still different and it's going to have a different culture. The coaches and the coaching staff set the culture. All right. And then it's your job to go get the players that are going to fit within that culture. And that's where sometimes coaches make mistakes because you go out and get the hot shot, the big stud who doesn't have any of the, the attributes that your culture is, like, is demanding. And that's just a recipe for complete disaster. And I think, think coaches fall into that all the time. It's like keeping a guy too long or recruiting a guy or missing. That's why missing on a recruit can be so brutal, depending on how much of an impact they have on the team. Um, so, yeah, coaches, you set the culture. I think it's, it's tough. And I, well, whether people want to talk about it or not, it's, it's a real thing and how you, how, you, how you maneuver and navigate through it. But, you know, there's, there's a thing where – you know, you don't have a lot of longevity in this industry, especially in college football where we are. And so, you know, to, to me, if you go in and, and I guess what I'm going to eventually get at here is what is the balance with this too. But you go and you take over a program and you want to instill your culture. Well, if you run off 17 of the 25 commits you had the year before, yep. it takes you it takes you three to four years to recover from that from a talent standpoint. Yep. And you don't have three to four years. If, if you don't turn a program around and start shifting it the right direction in two years – you're, you're most likely going to get fired. So, so is, is there a balance of, of instilling a culture when you take something over that, that maybe you deal with some, you allow more things in the beginning than you do at the end, or is it, you gotta, you gotta lay the law right now. And if people don't want to be, that's just, that's what it is. What, what are your opinions on that? Oh, this is what sucks, right? Because if I was talking to an athletic director, I'm like, you, if you're going to hire a new coach, you don't get to start grading him or her until year six five or six, you better be willing to give them five or six years to, to, especially if they're taking over a program. And usually if they're taking on a program, it's because it is a mess. And I'm like, you got to give them five to six, no firing. You make that contract five to six, you eat whatever you got to eat in terms of what performance, as long as like the culture, like in the sense of like they're good humans and they're not disrupting college campus or disrupting the team and they're not getting in trouble with the law and they're doing decent with grades and they're, you know, doing that kind of stuff. You can grade a coach on that stuff, turning that around, but performance wise, it's going to take five or freaking six years because you got to lay the hammer down right away. And I always tell coaches, you got to eat it that first year or two. I mean, yes, you're going to have to get talent in because if you let things wiggle right off the bat, you, everyone, that's how your team is going to see you. And so I know that you're taking a huge risk, but you're gonna eventually get fired. And typically coaches aren't getting fired because of the X's and O's, okay? Um, it's all this other culture stuff that you're talking about. It's all the performance mental skill stuff that honestly gets coaches in trouble. Um, and then eventually we'll catch up to them. But very rarely are coaches ever gonna be fired because of X's and O's, it's all this other stuff, especially with today's generation of kids. Yeah, I, I really, I couldn't agree more. I just, it's, you try to, if you try to instill more or more discipline, more rules and regulations, however you want to say that. If you try to go back and do that once, once you've already let things go, it's just, you're, you're never going to have success doing it. And once, once you've allowed it, that, that becomes a standard. And I, that's another thing that, that, you know, what you, you hit on is, is building a culture is hard. Maintaining a culture is, is can sometimes be a lot harder because a standard is every day. It's yeah. if, if, if a standard is not daily, is it, is it a standard at all? Right. Uh, and, and I think demanding that is, is tough. What, what uh, what advice do you have have for maintaining a good culture? Once you have it, what do you what do you what do you recommend for keeping it? I think it's checking in on it every day, like it's a living, breathing thing. And so, like I, I'm always saying, non negotiables, like and you can't have a million of them, right? Like we all have like a million things we probably would really want to see, but you've got to come up with what are our absolute non negotiables. And if we don't see this behavior or we don't do see this behavior, like we're in trouble. Like we need to see this every single day. 
Um, and it's checking in, whether you have someone on your staff who's constantly kind of checking in on it, whether you have a meeting every week and you're checking in on how was our, how are our non-negotiables? How did we live these out this week? Um, uh, and it's that commitment. We ask our athletes to commit to lots of different things. And again, commitment is behavioral. I should be able to see it. Well, I should be able to see tangible things. So making things measurable and making things um, that are observable um, are, I think, are really important. And the more abstract these things are, like, oh, like when athletes are like, I want to have fun. And then you ask them, like, well, what is fun? And they can't define fun for you. They're like, well, it's just not fun. I'm like, well, you don't even know what fun is. So, um, so I'm always like, well, then define fun. What does it look like? What does it feel like? How do I measure it? And so I think that's it, but it's gotta be something that is a top priority and that you don't slip on. Like it's gotta be something as valuable, if not more valuable than watching film or things like that. What, why I think coaches, especially on the men's side, um, watch so much freaking film as it's completely in your control and you feel like you're doing something where culture is sometimes, yeah, I want it observable and measurable, but it's exhausting to maintain culture. Um, and it's easy to sit and watch film. No offense. It is. Um, and a lot of times you guys are junkies about it. So I get it. And so it's this other stuff. That's not like an instant gratification. Culture is not an instant gratification. Watching film and being able to solve something is instant gratification, but that's the problem with culture. It's delayed. And I love that we knock our athletes all the time, but coaches can be the worst at the delayed gratification. Yeah. No, we're, we're, we're very, very, and I, I'm, I'm super guilty of this. We talk about it all the time. I'm very good at remembering the two guys that didn't do it the right way. And then I forget about the 98 that were freaking awesome that day. Yep. And, and you, you know, you're, you're quick to point out the two guys who had bad effort, but you forget about the 98 that are doing it the right way. And we're, I know I'm guilty of it. And I know us, especially in college football are, are very guilty of it. It's, I think it's a balance. It's, it's something that it's because we are, you know, we, we want, we want the best out of everybody and you, you know, but um that's a that's a that's a tough one for sure what about leadership do you do you tap into much of that with your cultural talks are you or is leadership does it coexist with your cultural talks yeah so here's the good thing about leadership okay like i am not a huge fan of captains anymore because how many captains are on a boat one so if you have a legit captain why do we have multiple captains I'm okay with like a football team because you have different positions. That's a different beast. So keep that in mind. But hockey usually does it right. They have one captain, two A's, right? One C, two A's. That makes sense to me. Um, we just don't have quintessential captains anymore um, where you are, you know, you're, you're able to say no. A ability to hold your teammates accountable and yourself accountable. Like those are two of the hardest things that most of this generation of kids aren't willing to do. They don't want to be the rat, so to speak. I hear that all the time. I don't want to be the rat. Okay, that's not a captain because the captain's going to see it as I'm not the rat. You're the rat. And now you're having me having to go hold you accountable. Thanks a lot. I'm not the rat. I'm, now you're, you're forcing my hand and I have to do something that's really uncomfortable and is draining my energy. And so I'm okay with the leadership is seeing as three different forms. You have the first followers and it's teaching who, how to follow and when to follow the right people. Um, you have a leader. A leader has a bunch of skills that are leadership qualities that we would like to see. And then you have the captain, right? The quintessential captain. And I just don't find that. And that's okay. I think having leader groups or having leadership councils, also coaches, you need to train and teach. I think you're, you need to teach, right? Um, like we, we just throw them into these roles and we're like, have at it. And I'm like, are you doing any education with them? Are you like challenging them in any way? Are you, how often are you spending, you know, culture? your leaders, that's who you should be spending a ton of time with. Right. Um, and so I just find that like really interesting is that we don't invest and we don't spend time. And, and a lot of these kids don't have the skill set to do it. And so there's really eight qualities that make up the quintessential leader for me. And if you're missing one, then you might be a leader, but you're not the leader. Is there a difference between teaching and developing it? Um, well, developing to teach, I can teach anyone something. But to develop someone, they have to be willing to put the work in. So you can teach anyone, but to develop someone, it takes the work on the other end for it to happen. And to be, become a better leader, man, do you have to put the work in as a, as a human to want to do that? Go ahead, Drake. Uh, I was just going to see if you could hit on those qualities, those eight qualities that you just Oh, mentioned. you're going to make me come off the top. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, um, align, alignment with organizational values is definitely one. So that's when they're in front of the team. They're not going, hey, guys, 
coaches are making me do this. So sorry. Um, you're owning it. Like this is what we're doing as a team. And then when they come into you, they can't be like coaches, man, you know, these dudes are jacked up. I don't mean to, you know, you know, this isn't me coach, you know, this is the guys. No, you're going in and saying we as a team own this. So that's a biggie that a lot of young men, women are, are not equipped to, to handle that. Um, hard work is one like, um, uh, trustworthy, like trustworthy that you're doing accountability, that you're doing what you're saying you're doing. Um, and then you're willing to hold others accountable, um, ability to say no, that doesn't require you to be nice, but you're willing to say no. Um, I'm going to miss some, I know it. Um, what are some of the others? Some of them are like, okay, like a lot of our athletes have this, but I can tell you the organizational values is a big one that a lot of kids aren't able to do, or even young men and women. Um, I find the ones comfort saying no, and then being able to hold each other accountable, holding the mirror up to your face and to others. Um, the hardworking, we find a lot. I love when people are like, what makes you different? Well, I'm hardworking. No, that hardworking is not any time, not anymore. That's just like, I'm sorry. That's just baseline foundation. Mm -hmm. Like if you're not working hard, I don't even know what you're doing. Um, and then the commitment, the behavior to the things on an, in and out of sport is one. Um, and I can always come up with the other up other couple but those are the biggies that's okay tiff i don't know how to spell hors d'oeuvre so <laughs> that's the word you decided to throw out it's a hard word to spell <laughs> it's a hard word i know yeah you could you could give me like 10 tries and i think i'd go for 10 yeah okay um, did you watch uh did you watch say the last dance or say or the last oh, dance yeah. <laughs> of course with michael jordan yep yeah what Bulls. did uh what do you think about his leadership style and just the culture of the Bulls team? What were you, I know you were probably assessing the entire time like I was. Okay, so I, I, before that came out, I talk about this all the time. There's a difference between like a Kobe Bryant and a Michael Jordan. So Michael was like, you better get on the same page with me or you're gone. Like you're gone, right? Mm -hmm. And so it was more of a dictatorship. Yes, like do it my way yep. or you're gone. You better figure it out. What, what made Kobe amazing and would work today and, and was working as he was different when Shaq left. When Shaq left, he realized if I'm as good as I say I am, I should be able to make anybody around me an all-star. So if I think I'm the player that is the best player on, in the planet right now, and I'm as good as I say I am, then my job is to get everybody around me to be their best and to be an all-star. And I think that's what separates the difference in leadership styles from Michael and from Kobe. I'm not saying they both can't work, but I find with today's generation, Michael would not work. Michael Jordan's leadership style would not work on most teams anymore. Kobe's would. And I actually am much more of a Jordan fan. I wasn't as much of a Kobe fan. I, I appreciate Kobe uh, as he aged and, and whatever. I appreciated him a lot more as I got, as he got older. Um, but I'm telling you right now that Michael Jordan, that's, and that should tell something to coaches that dictatorship does not work with this generation as much. A Kobe Bryant style is great. And I tell players all the time, you think you're so good. Then if you're with six year olds, you should be able to find a way to win with a bunch of six year olds, or maybe you're not as good as you say you are. So, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, sorry, my, my, my internet cut out for one split second there so i just got the end of all that okay um no that's great so i you know we, we've we've kind of surpassed the halfway point i want to make sure i talk about mental preparation too and i'm sure that we will we will go deep down that as well so let's just start it off with since i'm sitting next to a golf course right now yeah let's 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 visualize okay so you're you're hanging out with me on the golf course probably have some beers with us Okay. I might be I might be smoking a cigar. It just depends on what day of the week it is. Okay, excellent. And my five iron, which is my I love my five iron. I, I can hit my, my five iron two fifty. It's usually my, my good club. Let's say that I've I've all of a sudden gone and I've I've just hit it in the weeds five straight okay. times. Yep. And you're seeing you're seeing me build. It's building. Yep. You have you you have you have an opportunity to say something to me. What yep. are you gonna say? You need to practice more. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you're you think you're better than you really are like I mean why are you setting such high standards for yourself um it's the common thing um if I went went and asked you how long you practice for golf or I ask you like 
how do you practice? I think um, it's one of the, the things that drives me nuts, most nuts about my pro golfers and like the offers is in general or any of my coaches. You guys are like, I don't understand why our team is not performing the way that we did in practice. I'm like, because practice doesn't look like anything that they are now experiencing. So when you go and you're on the range and you hit your five iron and you're like, oh man, and you hit a hundred and you're like, look at how freaking good I am. And I'm like, I can look good on the range because you get into a rhythm and routine. And my thing is, is that when do you ever get to hit your five iron back to back or your driver back to back? Yeah, well, and so yeah, I look yeah, at you and I would laugh and say, talk to me about your practice, you know? And so, yeah. and you guys get so upset. And then I'm like, why are you getting so upset? Because you can't do this in practice, let alone now. So that's one basic thing is because you guys get upset when you shouldn't. Um, and then it's like, then, then it's coming up with the house. Like if you're building and building and building, what I call is getting in your red zone when you're getting anxious, nervous, pissed off, frustrated, and you start to then tense, you not being able to hit your five iron has nothing to do with your five iron. Now you're trying to hit your five iron with your hands like this. And you can't bring the club back the way you would. Your, your plane is going to be different as you're coming through. Yes. And so yep. I'm like, it's not your five iron. It's this, it's your brain. That's the problem. Don't blame the club. That's why strength coaches don't golf, Tiff. Yeah. Oh, and you try to kill it, and then you're trying to hit it harder. The story of my life. You're exposing yeah. me on. You're exposing me on this podcast right now. Um, almost anyone on here would probably be exposed. You're just being vulnerable. <laughs> Look at you demonstrating vulnerability, Matt. Yeah. There you go. Lead. Yeah. Lead from the front, right? Yeah. 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 Exactly. I don't. So golf. tell us about the. I've, I've, yeah, that's a good decision. Tell that's us about the, <laughs> the three, the three color system, right? There's, there's three of them. There's green, yellow, red. Is that right? Well, that's, that's, that's how I use something different. I have uh, green, um, which is chill, relaxed. There's like two different greens. There's green, green in sport and green out of sport. So green in sport, um, that's lackadaisical mind wanders, low energy, all of that. Right. And then there's green out of sport, which is great. Most of our athletes and coaches don't spend enough time in green zone, which is relaxed, letting your mind be creative, stepping away and just like enjoying life and not focusing on anything. And, and so there's ways to train. I want you to know how to get into green zone because you should be stealing green zone moments during the day so that you can rejuvenate and your brain can heal itself. Okay. Green in sport is not usually good other than golf and baseball sometimes because those, those games and the rounds are so long, there's no way you can lock in laser focus for all that time. But other than that, all my other sports, I'm like, suck it up. You guys got two hours. You're going to freaking focus. You don't get to go green in, in a competition. Red zone is what I just said, stress, pressure. You're thinking about the future or you're thinking about the past. That's always a way I'm thinking about what ifs, or I'm thinking about pissed off because there's a bad call or because um, I made a mistake. Blue zone is present focus, laser locked in focus, high intensity, controlling the controllables, confident, like all of that kind of stuff. Doesn't mean you don't make mistakes. Doesn't mean that you execute. It's just your mindset is where it needs to be. So that's the red, blue, and then there's green in, green out of sport. One thing I love that Jordan said in the last episode, episode 10, was he said, why, why would I worry about a shot I haven't taken yet? Like, why, yeah. would, why would I worry about the shot that I haven't taken yet? And I'm like, God, that's so – or why would I worry about missing the shot I haven't taken yet was the, yeah. I think the exact quote like yeah. I'm like that's 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 fantastic so you you talked about stealing green moments how do we do that how can we spend more time in the green throughout the day how can we steal those moments so disconnecting from our devices because anytime we're on our device you automatically go into red zone our cortisol levels which is the stress hormone goes up 80 percent anytime we are attached to a device um, and so any right away I'm like put that away go for a walk um, let your mind wander, breathe, like breathing techniques and learning that. I, I think a lot of people are like, oh, meditation. Well, meditation can be in all forms. I meditate when I'm, I guess, meditate when I'm walking. Like I just let my mind wander and I let it go. But that means no devices um, and breathing and just taking it in. What are you looking at? Are you just looking at nature or whatever? It could be 10 minutes. I'm not saying it has to be hours. Like a lot of coaches and everyone are like, I don't have time. I'm like, well, something's important enough to you. You're find the time to do it. So um, it's amazing what happens when you just give yourself 10 minutes to let your mind wander and go and, and how like fulfilled you can feel or rejuvenated you can feel. Um, taking a nap or going to sleep is not, I love my athletes are like, oh, green zone. 
I go to sleep and I'm like, that is not stealing green zone moments because you wake up and then everything is still there. Um, and you were just trying to like sleep, you know, drinking is not a way to steal green zone moments. <laughs> Sorry. Maybe smoking a cigar. I don't know. I don't know the research behind that one. Um, so, um, <laughs> But it is, it's just letting your mind go and wandering. And, and again, I'm a, I'm a big, as long as you're not on a device, like you could go get coffee with a friend, you know, it can be a variety of different ways to, to go about doing that. But I don't care if you steal five minutes. I think a lot of our athletes, when they're in college, they steal green zone moments during class. But you know, hey, it's gonna be optimal for performance. I mean, <laughs> just not in the classroom. So if I want to jump in here and ask you a question about sure. You know, you're talking about just going for a walk and letting your mind wander. Well, what if what if in that 10 minutes you're only finding yourself mon wandering into red zone thoughts? You know, how do you how do you control those? Should you control those thoughts? How do you bring yourself back? You know, where awesome. where do you stand there? Awesome. So often when we let our mind wander, it goes to the places that we really need to deal with. So if our mind is wandering to red zone moments, then that's something we're dealing with. Your brain is amazing. It's trying to keep you, it's a psychological immune system. You're, it's trying to keep you in balance, homeostasis. And so if we're going to the, the, the negatives, it's because we need to be dealing with that stuff. So one of the big things is journaling after that and just getting it out. So if you went to red zone, like what was the common themes of that? And like, what are things that you can control and tackle? Is it, you need to have a hard conversation with someone. Is it something where you have a significant other and you guys are not doing well and you need to figure that out? Is it, um, you keep going with how much stuff you have on your plate. Well, is there a way to organize that better? Like whatever it is, but I'm a big, like, if it does go, let it go negative, let it go to those red zone places. Just what are you going to do afterwards? Um, and also understanding that if you're going to those places, okay, that's, that's your brain trying to help. So. That's fascinating. Drake, did you have something? Yeah. Uh, Tiff, you, you mentioned the cortisol study and, and with the cell phones, how it, it spikes 80%. Um, I'm familiar with that study, but do you think that the new age, like the new athlete that comes through and um, they're starting out so much younger, they're like, you see babies on devices now. Do you think the athlete that's being brought up on a device throughout development will still have that cortisol spike as they get older? Or do you think it'll almost adapt to it or just – it's interesting. Like they're going to definitely still have, um, it's almost like they get the spike when they don't have it mm -hmm. uh, initially um, because it's like part of them and they go through a draw when they don't have it. Um, but they're still there. Our, our athletes are living in a fight or flight state all the time. It's the social perfectionism. It's the FOMO. It's all of that kind of stuff. So whether they're on it or not on it, I guarantee you we're going to see still red zone response. Now, do they have more cortisol spikes when they don't have it versus on it? But it's not healthy. This is not good. Um, and just because you're always on it doesn't mean from the beginning doesn't mean that that's not going to stop because they are social perfectionism. They are like um, constantly trying to be on the social media is awful. I mean, suicidal thoughts go up 60%. Um, when you're on social media more than two hours a day. And I'm finding our student athletes in college and my pros are on social media anywhere between seven to nine hours a day. Mm -hmm. So, so say, say you have an athlete that has trouble getting in that green zone outside of sport. Mm -hmm. uh, who, and they're, they're really not, they're struggling with finding an outlet. Mm -hmm. uh, whose job, say you don't have a mental performance coach in an organization does that fall on the strength coach, you think, or more so a sport coach, or what's your opinion on that? If you strength and conditioning and performance coaches and athletic trainers just become psychologists, whether you like to or not. So, yes, a lot of times it does fall on you all and, and, and also on athletic trainers. Um, it's amazing how freely student athletes or athletes will talk in front of the athletic trainers, and they're always like, Tiff, how did you find this out? Like, you must have, like, a mole somewhere, and I'm like, the mole is you guys just talk freely in front of your athletic trainers all the time and the strength coaches. Like they're not there. Like they're not listening to you. Um, well, someone on my team must have said something. No, you did right in front of adults um, who are then going to go talk to somebody about it. Um, so, I mean, a big thing with this is also the identity piece of this is like, where's your identity lie and working through that because if your identity is just as an athlete, you have a bad practice or a bad performance and you're a bad human. 
And so that's something to try to parcel out is what else are you good at? And what you're good at might allow you to be a great athlete, but it's who you are, not what you do. And it's, it's, it's helping. That's one of the first questions I deal with any athlete is, and that's the thing you talk about relationships and talking is asking them about anything but sport. Like, I'm always like, if you stop playing your sport now, I'll still care about you. But they need to really, really know that because so many of them, especially the really, really good ones, they're, they think people just want to be around them because of how good they are, or where they're going to go. Yeah, that's going back to the walking thing. This is one thing I'm, I'm thinking about now is because we, you know, like very hard to find self-developmental time. You know, it's a balance of, of it all. But like for me, typically when I'm driving in the car, I'm listening to a book yep. or like taking, taking like Spanish lessons while I drive uh-huh. or I'm, I'm walking and I'm listening to a podcast. Like, is that, is that not, would you say no or? Uh, it depends what it's on. If it's work related, then no. Um, like LeBron James will lead, read fiction books um, before a game where he can just let his mind wander and go into the, into the books, right? It's, it helps him stay in the green zone until he has to go blue zone, right? So he'll read Hunger Games or Twilight or something like that because it's just like you can just kind of fall into it and it's not taking any effort. If it's, if you're having to put effort into paying attention and listening, then no, it's not a green zone. But if you're listening to something where you can get lost in it and it's fun and easy, that's fine. But I have a feeling like a lot of you guys listen to podcasts that are very deep or have something to work. And so you're constantly like, Oh my God, how can I connect that to work? And how is that all adding up? And then I'm like, well, no, now you're not in the green zone. I feel like I'm, I'm either one of those two things you just said, but I don't think about it like in a negative light, I guess like sometimes when I'm listening to a podcast, it's just, I guess it's, it's really easily digestible. And if I, if, if, yeah. if I'm doing that, but there's sometimes I'm listening to a podcast where I'm like, Oh my God, 15 minutes just went by and I didn't hear one thing. Yeah, and it's, it, it's, it's yeah, it means I'm in the ground. I'm, I'm deep. And so I guess that's sometimes I think of that as like a negative thing. I'm like, Oh my gosh, like I'm just, I'm flustered right now. I can't get anything accomplished because, but that's, that's actually a good thing. So. Heist, yep. that's that's good for me, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah that's... It's not good if you're a student and you're trying to read and you're reading the same paragraph 15 times and it just took an hour and you haven't read anything. So is it what you said then? Do you have to deal with that thought to get past that? Because that's a real thing, right? Like you're reading and you're just like, man, I just can't get, I can't get this through my head. What would you tell them? You got to deal with it? Either you got to take a break and go or you got to use what you would use in sport and how do I lock in right now? Like, it just depends. And that's the thing is I laugh when kids are like, I was in the library for eight hours. I'm like, what are you doing in the library? Checking people out when they walked in, like taking a nap, like reading the same paragraph 25 times. There's no way you can be in the library for eight hours studying straight. Like that's impossible. You can't be in blue zone for eight hours straight. So my thing is, is I'd rather than chunk up how they're reading or you chunk up what you're listening to um, and, and do it in chunks so that when you're locked in, you're locked in. When you're not, you can just go and do daydream or do whatever. But yeah, I laugh when athletes are like, coach, I was in the library for eight hours. I'm like, you were totally checking out people. Like you were trying to pick someone up. Like there's no way. I, I don't know. Coaches. Large, ahead, large Dunkin, large Dunkin Donuts, iced coffee. <laughs> might be eight hours in the library. I might yeah. have done that a time or two. Yeah. That's what I was saying. Most strength coaches will just, they get in that zone and they just take a, take a shot of espresso and chase it with some NL explode or something. Oh, like good. A, perfect. A, Way to model behavior, gentlemen. Awesome. I don't, I don't do that. There are oh. people on this screen that do. Oh, I, oh. I am not. I have I'm no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> So, oh, come on, dude. <laughs> it's an oldie, oldie, but goodie. Oh, yeah. What about, what about like optimal levels of arousal tiff? What do you think about that? And then, and then what about the individuality of it? As far as you got 105 football players and they, yes. they potentially all have a little different level of arousal. Like we're with them all pregame. Yep. What should we be doing to kind of get them and, and help everybody be in their optimal level? I think it's allowing for individual differences. We don't allow this enough. We think a guy who wants to listen to his own music is not a team guy. Or we, someone who's a guy who wants to run through a brick wall and is all amped, like we tend to like that. Like, oh, he's ready. And I'm like, well, and some of this, if you guys know what the athlete disc behavioral assessment is, some of this goes into behavioral styles. Um, But you're going to have guys who are like 
geeked up, like jazzed up, like chest bumping, high fiving, dance party, want to be with everybody. And that's great for them, but that's not everybody. That might be 25 to 35% of your team might be like that on a football team. Some guys are like, I'm going to freaking pound someone. And they get like, like you're, you got to get them out of the red zone because they're ready to literally run through a brick wall, which is not optimal. They might be the dudes that are, or women that need to listen to like, um, classical music or something, right? They're not, it, here's the thing. It's not what you want. It's what they need. And I think sometimes athletes and coaches, we, we want them, we want our way, but that's not what they need. And so I'm constantly saying, I know you want that, but that's not what you need to, for optimal performance. And then you have people who are just like quiet and you're like, oh, they're not ready. Oh, they're not ready. And they're totally getting ready, you know? And then you got other people who are like really routine based, you know, they're tying this shoe and then they're tying this shoe and they got to do their hair and they got to do this and they got to do that. And that's just their way of like methodically getting ready. And so what I say is, is there a time that everyone has to come together and do something as a team? Yes. But it's not as long as we usually make it. And I'd much rather for individual differences, but every player should be able to tell you, I need this because this is how it's getting me ready. Not the, I don't know. I just do it. Like, I can't stand that. Like, I'm okay if a player says, Tiff, I know I need this because it puts me in my blue zone or it keeps me green until I have to go blue. I don't need that much time to go blue. Or this keeps me out of the red zone because when you're in the red, you're just wasting energy. You know? So when guys get up, it's my lovely strength coaches, and you guys don't have a game until seven, and you walk into breakfast, and you guys are like, it's freaking game day! And I'm like, why are you in the blue zone? You are wasting energy. <laughs> um we don't go for another X amount of time. So I'm always like, that's the other thing is it's all about energy and managing it. When you're working with like Olympic teams and you're working with that, it's teaching like, how do you guys manage your energy all day? And when do you transition into that, that, like you said, optimal arousal and everyone is different and how you get there is different. Well, how can you help them define those, those for themselves? Because as you were saying before, you, you see some guys pre prepare in one way and like, you might know that's not what they need and mm -hmm. it is what they want. How do you help them identify those things? Um, a lot of self-awareness. It's a lot of, um, and this is where like a lot of, especially men don't like this, but the, the reflecting piece, um, reflecting on like performance. So how did you like play today? What, how, and a lot of that is how did you warm up or how did you feel or what were you thinking and warm up? Um, and again, it's really getting them to be more honest with themselves because only they know what they're thinking and feeling, honestly. Like we can see behaviorally, but we don't know the why. So if we want to change behavior, we have to understand the why. And in order to understand the why, they have to understand the why, or we're just guessing. We might think we know. You guys, we don't know. Like, we might have 90% of what it is right, but it could be the 10% we don't know that is what's going to change behavior. And so that's where we got to get these men and young men, women, to learn, especially earlier on, like how to self-assess, how to self-reflect, how to be more honest. But kids today are told, too much of the time by coaches and adults. This is what you're thinking. And they're like, okay. Because the number of kids who will say, when you ask them a question and you say, what's going on? They're like, I don't know. I can't stand, I don't know. I'm like, if you don't know, how am I gonna help you? So again, it's getting them to reflect more. It's watching and seeing if you can find patterns and themes through the reflections and having a place where they feel like they can actually talk to you about this. Um, and at the end of the day, you hold the carrot. You don't perform well when you're like this. Let's go back and look at the track record over time. Same thing my wife says, Tiff. Yeah. Say, hey, what do you want for dinner, honey? I don't know. Say, well, do you know someone who might know what you do want for dinner? <laughs> well, that's all I, can ask them. <laughs> I would say pretend like you do know what would the answer be. They usually answer. Yeah. yeah. I, it's so funny you say that. I know, Drake, you had a question too, but just following up is like, I can remember early on in my career, it'd be Friday night before a Saturday game. We'd be in the hotel and – guys would be just dialed in and I would go back to my hotel room. I'd be like, honey, we are going to, I mean, we're going to kick their ass tomorrow. This is, yeah. I'm telling you. And then we'd go out and get blown out. And I'm yeah. like, I just don't understand. We were locked in. And then later down the road, it'd be Friday night. And I'm like, we're screwed there. We got no chance. These guys are bouncing off the walls. They're not yeah. locked in yeah. Kill tomorrow. And then we go out and like beat a team. We had no business beating. Yeah. And like that, that's where I really first started thinking about all of this, this stuff, you know? Yeah. And that's a thing, like, I just need you to be locked in, laser focused, high intensity when I need you to be there. I don't need you wasting energy, but I also don't want you in the red zone worrying and because that's exhausting. That like will totally fry you out. 
And so if guys are goofy and silly and doing all that, like if that's what they need, awesome. If they're like too relaxed, I don't need them. I, they can be too relaxed. And if they can get themselves in the blue zone, literally 10 seconds before it's go mode, I'm fine. But like every athlete has to know how long it takes them to get into that space. Some guys can just flip the switch and they're good. Like that's why LeBron and stuff reads because he knows as soon as he walks in the arena, heart rate goes up, he's ready to go. He doesn't need time. He needs to chill, especially with how many games they play in a season, right? But we also know with like some sports, like a football, if we don't see a like drooling and wanting to run through a wall, we're like, they're not ready. And I'm like, I'm, I'm worried about that. That's not good. So what point should they be there though? Like, cause there's, there's gotta be a time when everybody does turn it on. Is that, is that in yeah. warmups? Is that after the coin toss? When, when, when would you be worried if you didn't before you, before you warm up because your body isn't going to warm up if your mind isn't warmed up. So it's okay. like kind of like going to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Like why can we go to the bathroom, walk back and just fall right back asleep is because we don't have to hopefully think about going to the bathroom. Like it's just an automatic thing. So our body is moving, but our mind's not awake. So we got to be blue zone before we start warming up. I know strength coaches, performance coaches, you'll like this. As we think of warm up, the warm up isn't going to work if the brain isn't locked in and focused and you're not paying attention to details. Your body's not going to warm the way it should because your mind isn't. And then you're not going to be ready for the game. Yeah. All right. Go ahead, Drake. Sorry. I know you got to get one of the top hit on arousal too. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm going to regress a little bit, but. Just thinking you were talking about the disc ar arousal and kind of profiling um, athletes into different groups. I just think, like, how much more would we get out of training if we kind of profiled each athlete and trained them in those groups? So then maybe if you had, uh, like, one high group where you had the music turned all the way up, you're you know, high-fiving guys, high energy, and then you had another group where it was, like, real low-key. Yep. How, much, how much more – would we get accomplished in the weight room? You think if we broke it up that way, as opposed to just put everybody in one. That's a great room. question. Um, I think there's different ways to do it. Like I think, um, I think it's mixing it up because again, for me, it's not always having it be comfortable and easy. And also they have to learn how to get the best out of each other. And so like a high D who's result oriented has to learn how to deal with an S who's all about feelings and um, being loved on and like mm -hmm. being the team guy. Right. So some, yeah, is it, would it be way easy to put all the D's together until the D's want to kill each other? Cause remember the D's like want to be in control and like, who are they following? They all just start to go off in their own little world. So there are ways I've done things where all the D's you're performing together, all the I's, all the S's, all the C's or whatever, and like go, and there's pluses and minuses to that. Um, and then you can mix them all up and then they have to figure out how to deal or, you know what eyes, I know you need the really pump up music. You're getting no music. You got to bring your own energy. So you can do lots of cool things in the weight room that environmentally challenge them because that's what mental skills and mental toughness is. Mental toughness is that no matter what is going on around you, you have the ability to fight your way into the different men the mentality you should be in, no matter what. So if I'm playing classical music, you're going to find a way to bring it. No music, slipknot, like whatever. Like I did that like with a tennis team is we played slipknot all during practice because they hate it right i mean football might like it stereotypically but women do not female do not want to listen to slipknot and we did it because they were about to play a team that trash talks and, and creates a environment that's not optimal and they had to learn and so and then they they reflected afterwards and how were they what were they thinking what they, what were they feeling and it was awesome and it was a great way then to train like how so what are, what is going to be your way to fight out? So when you start to go like this, because Slipknot is playing and you're getting pissed because it's just raging in your head and you're not used to that as a tennis player. Well, what are you going to do about it now? How are you going to fight? Are you, are you willing to fight? And do you have the house to fight? And I think strength coaches, you have a ton of ability to change the environment um, in all different ways when you're in the weight room, either using behavioral styles or using music or using things that are just, you know, uncomfortable and then seeing how they respond to it. I love that because we often think about changing uh, physical parameters of the workout to make it a tough situation instead of changing environment. Um, I really like that. Mess with the senses. It's crazy when you mess with the senses. Temperature, um, sound, any of that kind of stuff. You guys could do a bunch of really cool stuff in there. That's cool. Um, one more question. It might be outside of the scope of – this a little bit, but any supplements that you recommend for high versus low 
I know like you maybe say give caffeine to the high guy or vice versa. Is there none of that? I'm not messing with anything. The only, uh, the only research that's out there, if you want to like get a little boost is drink a cup of coffee and take a 30 minute nap. And that's across the board for everyone. Like you shouldn't need anything. Use your bra- damn brain, train your brain. Like that's what we don't spend enough time doing. Train the freaking mm-hmm. brain, like put yourself in different places and train it. Like that's the thing. Everyone wants a shortcut to the one thing that holds us all back, which is the mental side of the game, right? And the mentality, and we all want shortcuts to it. And there's ways to opt to train the brain. Yeah, that's that's the big bucket for sure. I was just trying to nitpick there. Yep. But thank you for that. No worries. That's that's absolutely incredible, Tiff. I think we were, we were just like I said, we we've been talking about all this a lot lately. But mm-hmm. we were talking about this morning, just little things like you know days that I go into train that I whatever. I, it's it seems like it's starting off and it's challenging. I think to myself, man, let me get some let me get a different song on to really get me through this. Yep. Instead, I'll walk over to the radio and I'll just turn it off. And it's like yep. it's go time. It's you and find a way to get it done. And yep. you got it. That's 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 just a that's a really good point. And there's other ways that we can make things more challenging is change the senses. I, I, I love that. So, um, well, before we let you go, coach highest coach from now, did you guys have anything you guys wanted to ask? I just did want to mention that your, your staff does really appreciate those days when you turn the music off and everyone else is actually <laughs> just fine of an arousal state. And yeah. it's really, it's really good time for the rest of us. Uh, but no, I actually got my questions out during. So coach, coach, we now awesome. go ahead and chime in. Sure, yeah. Um, you know, not really, I guess, so much questions, but just wanted to uh, bring up, bring up a couple of the points that, uh, that you talked about Tiff. And I think uh, one of the ones that stood out to me at first was just talking about like, you know, how do, how do you audit your culture? Right. And uh, you know, what, what are your non-negotiables? And we, we just had a, you know, awesome, awesome talk with uh, Max Marzo last week of the podcast. And you know, he, he said a line that I really liked that I'm, I'm sure would align well with kind of what you were saying, but, you know, do, do a little, a lot, not a lot, a little, right? And I think when you talk about those non-negotiables, if you have, you know, 10 things that your student athletes must do every single training session, these yep. are what we stand for. It's, you know, that, that, that ends up being a lot to take in at once, right? So what can you do to kind of, you know, hack those things down a little bit so that, you know, instead of having 10 things, maybe you have three or four, but those three or four things really carry a lot of weight within your program. So I, I really liked how you put that. Yeah, just pick, pick your biggies, guys. Like I, I used to be a college professor and I, and I, and I would have, wanted to hammer them on so many different things and I'm like nope two or three what are my two to three non-negotiables um at the end of the day I just wanted them to learn right and that's the whole thing at the end of the day what are you really trying to get like what is the real real thing you're trying to get and typically it's gonna be to win right or really what you should be doing is how do we have the most consistent for high level performance within a spectrum really it's not about winning you can't control that but if we within this spectrum on a consistent basis that could lead to results right and so it's the same thing. What are those two or three things? What is our biggest bang for our buck? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, guys, Dr. Tiff Jones, this was absolutely unbelievable. Thank you so much for coming on and joining us. I, I know that for those of you who know me well, you know how much I, I preach and love, love talking about the mind and mentality. And uh, so this was absolutely awesome for me. I'm, I'm, I'm going to re-listen to this and, and uh, just so many things to apply here. So I just want to say really, really thank you. I think this is so – it's way too far outside the realm of what we normally talk about. And then I just – I really appreciate you bringing light to it and, and, and the career you've chose to, to really utilize your talents and do that. I think you're awesome. You're, you're a rock star. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll send you your bill for your um, golf tips later. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go golfing later. I'm going to tell you how they work. Okay, perfect. That means – so you're not golfing. You're going to go practice. Yeah, there you go. So. Okay, yeah. Good. All right, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed it. Remember, if you're listening to this and, and you are enjoying them, please, guys, go to www.coachesversuscovid19.com. Find the GoFundMe and donate anything you can have, whether it's a, a penny, a dime, a dollar, 20 bucks. Guys, it all helps, and it all helps us, like I said, us us together, coming together and fighting a, fighting for a good cause. So, Dr. Tiffany Jones, once again, thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in today. Thank you. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks. Thank you.